Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this video, we'll be looking at Chapter 3 of our textbook, which is on infancy. The first video, this is in four parts, is about the postpartum period and the newborn baby in the new world. So we'll look at some of the uh, things like postpartum depression, uh, some of the reflexes, ways of assessing the health of infants. And let's take a quick look at some of these things. The first one actually is about, not about the baby, it's about the mother. It's about maternal depression during the postpartum period. And what you find is that there are several different variations on, on this, which uh, range in both their prevalence and their severity. The first one um, we call baby blues. And most mothers experience that, about 80% of new mothers. And it talks about feeling let down, crying, and irritability. And it will just... Uh, disappear on its own pretty quickly. On the other hand, uh, postpartum depression uh, affects about one out of five new mothers, so that's 20%, and this can include things like the sadness, the helplessness, thoughts of suicide, uh, appetite, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, uh, fright, and that can actually take a year to uh, go away, and actually it needs to be treated. Um, and the last one, the most severe, which only affects about one out of a thousand new mothers, is postpartum psychosis, in which the mother actually experiences hallucinations and insomnia, agitation, and then r truly bizarre feelings of behavior. And this, again, occurs relatively quickly, but this is a very situation, psychosis always is, and requires really professional help. Now, the one thing that these three have in common, the baby blues, the postpartum depression, and the postpartum uh, psychosis, is that... Um, they are most likely due to the changes in the hormonal levels that accompany childbirth, both pregnancy and childbirth, um, going through a, a really wild roller coaster. And treatments for these can include uh, antidepressants and counseling, can also include estrogen treatments because that's one of the major hormones that's uh, fluctuating at this point. Now let's take a look at some of the things about the baby. We want to look about parent-infant contact and about some of the reflexes. And let's say very quickly, uh, bonding is a big issue. Um, that's what it says here up at the top of the page. Bonding involves the formation of attachment bonds. That's not a very helpful definition, but between parents and their children. And it's considered essential to the survival and well-being of children, not just the physical attachment, but the emotional bonding as well. Most studies have shown it's not necessary for parents uh, to have extended early contact with their newborn children for adequate bonding to occur. Um, in fact, many parents, for instance, actually adopt children. Uh, this is what I did. We've adopted our three children. They get them uh, during the first year or maybe even advanced ages and can still bond with them closely. Now, uh, it seems to work best with adopted children when they're adopted before they are 12 months of age. Uh, two of ours, we were there at the birth, and the, other, uh, and the third one, she was six months old, and so uh, fall into that category. Um, also, what you see here is the rooting reflex. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. I want to talk about some of the characteristics of neonates. And what you have here is the APGAR score. Now, APGAR, uh, if you look on the left column here, it stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, Respiratory. So it's, um, it's an acronym. Um, and the health of a newborn baby, that's also called a neonate, could be assessed right at birth with its APGAR score, its reflexes, and sensory capabilities. And you see that these are things that are really easy to assess, like What's the color of the skin? If it's blue, you've got a real problem. If uh, there's no heart rate, you've got a problem. If there's a uh, little muscle tone or a respiration. So this is very quick to assess. And again, if somebody has a low APGAR score, uh, it, it goes from zero to 10. Um, they'll be whisked off to the newborn intensive care unit very quickly. Um, you can also look at reflexes. So we had the rooting reflex in the last slide. Uh, these are simple automatic responses that are uh, elicited by certain kinds of stimulation. And uh, newborns show them almost immediately. And they can reveal a lot about the baby's neural functioning, such as uh, neural immaturity or you have slowed responsiveness. Some of these include the rooting and the second reflexes. So rooting, you just touch a baby on the side of the cheek and they'll turn their head uh, to your finger and they'll start sucking on it. And these things, you know, not surprising, they're pretty basic to survival. Um, now let's look at some of the sensory abilities of neonates. Now, this is a, this is a funny set of pictures. Again, it's the sweet, sour, and bitter solutions. And you see that one of these is definitely preferred over the others. Um, 
Uh, let's talk about vision for a second. Neonates, they can see, but they're nearsighted and really only see things that are within seven to nine inches in front of their eyes. So it's got to be close, which is one of the reasons that when people are talking to babies, they usually hold them up really close to their faces. Um, their visual accommodation and convergence abilities, they're immature for the first few months of life, so it takes a little while for them to get uh, the vision really working well. Now, in terms of hearing, normal neonates, excuse me, normal neonates, they can hear well, they can respond to sounds of different pitch and amplitude, and hearing plays a role in uh, attachment bonds. That shouldn't be too uh, hard to understand. And, and their responsiveness to speech. In fact, neonates are especially responsive to the sounds and rhythms of human speech. Um, now, in terms of smell, neonates can discriminate uh, distinct odors, and they actually can show... Uh, the way you can tell this is they show more rapid breathing patterns and increased bodily movement. Again, because they have this undifferentiated entire body movement at once. So, And they show these things in response to powerful odors. They also show sensitivity to the smell of milk, which makes sense, and even to their mother's underarm odor as early as one week. Again, when you're nursing, you're, you're pretty close to that. And so you can understand how these would be really important things. Um, also, in terms of taste, we show that neonates, they're sensitive to different tastes, like you can see in these photos, and they show preferences uh, for certain tastes, just like uh, adults do. Okay, now how about learning? Um, and really about conditioning. Neonates, or newborns, seem to be capable of both classical and operant conditioning. And so in the classical conditioning of neonates, the involuntary responses are conditioned to new stimuli. So it's kind of carried over from the one to the other. And they've shown that you know, neonates, like any other living organism, um, will perform behaviors to receive reinforcers. And so they have the capacity for operant conditioning just as much as you know anything else. Okay, sleeping and waking. Uh, what you see here is that newborns spend about two-thirds of their time sleeping. So, for instance, in this chart, which I wish went up to 24 hours, you see that the, the newborns are sleeping 16 hours a day. Um, and Now, most infants have a, several sleeping and waking cycles, about six of them in a 24-hour period, so they're about four hours long each. Now, you can have naps that get up to four and a half hours long, um, and you can have it, they'll be awake for as little as an hour during the time. That'll typically be at night, if you're lucky. Um, and then you see that, you know, it's not until they're almost two years old that they are um, uh, awake half the day. They, they are uh, sleeping most of the time. And you also find that different infants require different amounts of sleep, and they have different patterns during the night, but almost all of them break it up through the night and the day. Now, one of the most interesting things about this particular chart, uh, aside from the fact that it shows us that really old people only need about five hours of sleep, is that um, the really big amount of time that newborns spend in REM or dreaming sleep, in fact, it's half the time, Whereas for most people, it's a much smaller percentage of the time. It's about a, well, it's about a fourth. Um, they spend much more. Um, one of the arguments for this is that the brain develops in response to visual stimulation. And what's interesting is that that visual stimulation can even come from the brain to stimulate the growth of the brain. Okay, a um, little bit more about sleeping and waking. And what you know, of course, is that babies cry and the main reason that babies cry is pain. You know, they're not trying to manipulate you necessarily. They're, they're in pain. And crying, it, it's a healthy thing and it appears to be universal. And a high-pitched cry uh, can indicate urgency and distress. Babies are can be soothed through a number of ways. You know, you activate the sucking reflex by giving them a pacifier or, you know, or by nursing. Uh, also, just picking them up, patting them, caressing them, rocking them, swaddling them, speaking in low voices. And what's funny, of course, is these are the things that nearly everybody does automatically. But it turns out that these are the things that infants are especially receptive to. So it lets you know that the conditioning works not just for children, but it works for their caregivers as well. Last slide for this particular section is about sudden infant death syndrome, um, or SIDS, where a child dies. Um, Sudden infant death syndrome is the most common cause of death during the first year. So there's a number of risk factors. Now, keep in mind, these things are predictors um, that not necessarily causal because it looks like it may be caused, as the, as the slide here says, by um, low sensitivity to serotonin in the 
in the medulla at the top of the brainstem. Uh, I should mention, by the way, your brain's not really that big. It should be substantially smaller to show the accurate size for this kid. Anyhow, but here's some of the risk factors. These are correlates. These are predictors, not necessarily causal. So two to four months old is the highest, being put to sleep on your stomach or your sides, being a premature or low birth weight uh, infant. Um, also, interestingly, low socioeconomic status, uh, being a male child, uh, being African-American, being born to a teen mother or to mothers who smoked or used narcotics during or after pregnancy. Um, anyhow, it, there's a lot of different predictors. In terms of what you can actually do about it, you know, obviously things about uh, putting them to sleep on their back would be better. Um, but the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics makes the interesting suggestion of simply giving children pacifiers when they go to sleep, that that seems to help reduce the risk of SIDS. And that's where we're going to finish for this particular section.